Every day, two million of us take off and land somewhere in America. 600 million passengers boarded a flight last year, and the number is expected to surpass a billion this decade. The sky has no limits, but the ground does. As airports struggle to keep up with the pace, the anxiety of flying increases. Although flying remains the safest mode of transportation, thousands of times safer than car travel, there are no small air accidents. Most cost lives. Logan Airport, October 12, 2000, 8 a.m. Bound for Chicago, Flight 123 takes off over Boston Harbor. In less than a minute, it will disappear from the radar screen. Coast Guard divers begin the search for survivors. At the airport, a command center is set up. Well, the plane is in this area, so the whole area here is coming Jet fuel is a primary concern, although that's going to evaporate faster than it can uh, be boomed off. To shut down Day Boulevard, the South Boston area, to get emergency vehicles or personnel over here to Logan Airport through the tunnel. You have a number there, I can get the uh, incident commander on the phone with the medical examiner. I'll find out. Right. The Navy ship Grapple, a veteran of many deep sea salvage operations, is on the scene. I'm calling to check to see if uh, debris has been taken yet. The first wreckage arrives on shore. We do have several airline personnel and American Red Cross on scene, and we will be transitioning that family assistance center over to the airline once they're able to get all their national resources and assets in place. Fortunately, it's only a drill. Every major airport conducts similar exercises in preparation for the disaster they hope they will never see. We have to practice. We have to keep sharp. We have to keep ready to prepare and be able to respond in an appropriate manner when these things happen. It happened on July 17, 1996. TWA Flight 800, en route from New York to Paris, burst into flames off the coast of Long Island. A terrorist attack was the first assumption. Eyewitnesses claimed to have seen a missile in the sky. All 230 people on board this Boeing 747 were killed. In an unprecedented 18-month recovery effort, investigators salvaged thousands of pieces of wreckage from the ocean and assembled the 747 fuselage. Boeing engineers, airline pilots, NTSB, and FBI experts used it to solve the puzzle of what brought down TWA Flight 800. The explosion that uh, broke apart the airplane occurred in this center wing tank, which is this area that goes from approximately here forward to right up in here, the area of the forward spar. This center wing fuel tank is the size of a two-car garage. We knew that the airplane had been um, sitting um, at the airport for a number of hours um, in a very, very warm um, day. The temperatures were, I believe, in the upper 80 degrees. Located under the center fuel tank of the Boeing 747 were two air conditioners cooling the aircraft as it awaited takeoff. It is our belief that putting a, a device that can produce heat into the bottom of a fuel tank, under a fuel tank, um, makes no sense when you have a petroleum-based fuel in that tank. The fuel in the tank vaporized under the heat generated by the air conditioners. 
The theory was that a short circuit channeled excessive voltage into the tank, igniting the vapor. Unfortunately, investigators did not find evidence of faulty wiring. So the precise mechanism of the explosion remains a mystery. At Boeing, the goal is to build a perfect aircraft. With 626,000 parts fastened together by 600,000 bolts and rivets, a new 757 is being assembled. This twin-engine jet will carry up to 239 passengers. Its loaded weight of a quarter million pounds is comparable to a train locomotive, but it moves considerably faster, 550 miles per hour. It has to survive strenuous mid-air engine stall tests, sudden altitude drops, steep climb takeoffs, and emergency braking. The customer for this 757 is American Transair. The buyer and the seller have a full day to inspect the plane. Joe Akers is Boeing's quality controller. I have a bit of an oil leak up here, this drain line. Ken Kaiser represents ATA. I'll get him to fix this. Together, they look for the smallest oil leak or loose electrical connection, which could jeopardize the safety of the aircraft. any metal shavings down in here in the dinatrol or anything. All the bolts have a good threads exposed. Captain Bruce Jacobs came to ferry the new aircraft to Chicago where it will pick up its first passengers. The 757 is among the safest aircraft ever built. Redundancy is the key. Everything we see is generally electrically powered. And any time that source fails, there is always another redundant source to power the same instrument. We have five sources of electrical power that'll power the whole aircraft. We have to get ourselves prepared every takeoff. It can never be routine and uh, be ready for the possibility of uh, an engine failure or having to stop the aircraft on the runway or continue the takeoff if we're beyond a certain speed on a single engine. ATA customer inspection of the new 757 is finished. Now the deal will culminate with an expensive handshake. And here we have the bill of sale. The price is $60 million. The next thing is the aircraft receipt. Each of the two engines, $5 million apiece. Well, the last thing is to present you with the cockpit key. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Pilots marvel at the perfection of these flying machines. But aircraft technology is only one link in the chain of air safety. On October 31st, 2000, a typhoon rolled into Taipei, the capital of Taiwan. During takeoff, Singapore Airlines Flight 006 turned onto a closed runway, struck a concrete barrier, and barreled ahead at more than 150 miles per hour into a construction site where it hit an excavator and other heavy equipment. Passengers felt two violent bumps. Then they saw objects inside the cabin moving in all directions. When the plane ground to a halt, many seats were gone. The plane burst into flames and broke apart into three sections. 83 of the 179 people on board were killed. The plane's cockpit voice recorder confirmed that Singapore 6 was cleared by the tower to take off from runway 05 left, and the pilot was heard repeating the instruction. A minute later, he said he could see the runway. But Captain Fung 
was looking at runway 05 right, which was being repaired. To indicate they're out of use, closed runways are marked with a big cross, but there was none, investigators established. Experts from the National Transportation Safety Board and Boeing arrive in Taipei. Investigators are at a loss to explain how Captain Fung, with more than 10,000 hours of flying experience and who had flown from Taipei Airport 10 times before, could have made this deadly error. It slid to one side, hydroplane, and part of it hit this culvert, which made it slide around in the other direction at, at a portion during this uh, sequence. Pieces are coming off the aircraft, engines are coming off, landing gear is spreading itself. All these things end up on the runway. And in addition to that, this aircraft is, is loaded with fuel enough to fly over to JFK. So the main tanks are full and they get punctured and this fuel starts to ignite because of the the uh, sparks along the runway with the uh, various pieces of the aircraft sliding along the runway and igniting this fuel. We may never know why the pilot of Flight 006 made a wrong turn at Taipei International Airport. But investigators are analyzing the post-crash fire that took 83 lives and are trying to learn from it. On the other side of the runway, you can see the aft section of the 747, the uh, empennage basically, to include the uh, vertical fin, and some people actually were in there at the time of the crash and were rescued. Since I was involved in the uh, TWA 800 investigation, I was interested in seeing what happened to the center tank in this particular accident, but it's hardly recognizable. The fire was so intense that it melted a lot of it. Half a world away at the Federal Aviation Administration lab in Atlantic City, Gus Sorkos dreams about a fireproof aircraft. Temperatures in that flame are 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a very intense fire. This simulates a post-crash fire involving jet fuel. His focus is on the insulation used in the cabin walls, the protective barrier between fire and lives. A newly developed insulation is subjected to flames. How much time will passengers have to be evacuated before the fire burns through the layer of insulation? We expect that this material will prevent a fire from burning through for a minimum of four minutes. And if you combine that time with the additional protection provided by the aluminum skin and the side walls, this is more than adequate time for all people to evacuate in the event of a post-crash fire for almost any conceivable situation. Okay, you've got three minutes, 20 seconds now. This material here for more than five minutes has prevented flame penetration. This is more than enough to be effective in, in any type of post-crash fire situation. So this, this would be the type of material that could be used as a burn-through barrier. 6.15 right now. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Back in Taipei, experts turn to questions of survival. Their focus is on the rear section of the cabin, not affected by the fire. A upper was failed. B upper was failed okay. and C lower was failed. During the impact, the overhead storage bins came crashing down onto passengers sitting in the center aisle. One of the passengers that I interviewed said that it, he saw the bins coming down as they were impacting. We would expect the bins to be on that side of the galley, actually. Uh -huh. But now they're on this side. It may have happened when they rolled it upright again. And... The role of crash investigations is not only to find the cause of the accident, but also to suggest new directions in air safety research. And the excess on this one's here, and the excess on this one's over here. At the FAA Tech Center in Atlantic City, drop tests are performed to test improved overhead bin designs. 
If we go much above 25 Gs, I expect that BIM to fail. So it depends on the G level, whatever we achieve. Uh, and this will probably be somewhere around 20, 25 G. The 10 foot fuselage section will be dropped from a height of 14 feet. Three, two, one. The newly designed overhead bins stayed intact. The instances where we've seen problems with overhead storage bins have been those kinds of crashes that were very, very severe. Matter of fact, they were at the limits of human survivability. But the fact remains, if people can survive the crash, they shouldn't be injured by anything within the aircraft that might injure them and come loose, storage bins being one of those issues. At the Oklahoma City FAA Civil Aeromedical Institute, another aspect of crash survival is tested. Dummies, outfitted with electronic sensors, are used to test the crash worthiness of seats. At impact, when passengers are strapped to their seats, surviving or avoiding injuries may depend on the seat's design. This test simulates a sudden impact at takeoff, similar to what happened in Taipei. By measuring the severity of head injuries, the researchers will gauge the survivability of the crash. High-speed cameras record the event. Looks like we've had a hit impact on the tray table here. See the evidence right there of what happened. Okay. Well, the uh, restraints are intact. They didn't come loose. They look good. Calculations based upon the numbers we acquire from those sensors gives us a predictor of the likelihood of injury had this been a real person. In this case, the, the larger dummy, the adult male, the number we got from his head impact indicated the likelihood of serious head injury was very low. Specialists at the NASA Langley Research Center impact small airplanes in order to study their crash worthiness. Improved technology and better human skills are crucial in accident prevention but it takes an airline to orchestrate both elements. Chicago's Midway Airport is the hub for Indianapolis-based American Trans Air. Your arriving destination, which is San Francisco, gate C2, which is the aircraft that just came in right now. With 100 daily arrivals and departures from its hub, ATA is continuously training new ramp personnel. I'm going to go over to B-12, see a departure. Every plane flies 12 to 15 hours per day. There are only 30 to 40 minute stops between loading and unloading the cargo, letting passengers in and out, changing the crew, and maintaining the aircraft. The ramp operation is an art of choreography. If you notice, he's opening the door. You get into the, you're going to start getting the bell loader. The bell loader's going to come over here. You're going to start working on it. All right, what do we got here? We got a transfer tag, right? Yes, sir, somebody has to be behind the jetway to see uh, if it's clear. Stop to that, no problem. This is the last thing. The captain sees, right? This is the last thing we do. Show him the bypass pin, salute him, and he's off. The ramp is so dangerous out there that we have to make sure that everyone is in their position when it gets in. If they're out of position, then we could have an incident, incident where uh, a bag cart is actually sucked into an engine. ATA has a near-perfect safety record. One hard landing with no fatalities in its 27 years in business. Clear. 
One reason is its strong emphasis on aircraft maintenance. See that the airline opened its own school for mechanics. You guys remember the Air Alaska crash? That was an MD-80, the same type of jack screw or similar to it. That Air Alaska flight, what happened was the bearings on this roller were not greased properly or they skipped an inspection part of the A-check. Check, check so the mount. They lost control of the airplane, is that what they did? They lost complete control of the airplane because he couldn't move that elevator. Initially trained on small planes, the graduates will be taking care of ATA's jetliners. ATA operates one of the oldest fleets in the industry. Half of their planes are between 18 and 25 years old. Their fleet of 19 Lockheed 1011s is the largest of any airline. Here you can see that we've opened up the cargo door and we've gone inside to inspect inside the cargo bay behind the fire retardant lining to see how the systems are working inside that area. Over here you can see that we've opened up the top of this engine, it's called the pylon, and we're looking at the air ducts and the controls that run down there into the engine to see what kind of service they're in. We've also opened up the leading edge of this wing so that we can look at the ducts that run down the wing and the wiring and the cables that run there to see what kind of condition they're in. Here in this panel are all the connections for where the engine and the airplane meet. We're going to look inside here to make sure that everything is in the right position, that we don't have any leaks, that there's no chafing on the wire. We're also going to look out through the pylon here where they run down on top of the engine. In the 70s, these wide-body jets were considered the most advanced of their time. The government does not limit the age of commercial aircraft. They simply must meet FAA safety standards. And since the L-1011's design is still impressive, it makes sense to essentially rebuild the aircraft every three to five years. This is the front part of an engine that was found during one of our inspections to have damage. We've now cut the damage out and we're getting ready to replace this damage with a new piece. Mechanical problem in San Francisco on one Delays are every airline's headache. Last year, a quarter of all flights nationwide were delayed. 778 in Cleveland has a flap lockout problem. Um, he has done a gate turn back. He's already approaching uh, two hours delay. When a congested airport pairs with bad weather, it has a domino effect on airline operations. Our morning has started off rough with LaGuardia again. Over the last uh, couple of months, we continue to have problems with overcapacity at LaGuardia and combined with that with low ceilings and weather. I don't think uh, cancellation is really an option. I think the loads are too high for us to look at cancellations presently. Yeah, I think we're going to have to stay with, uh, with the delays, obviously, with an 89% load factor. There's no way we're going to be able to cancel. Rebuilding the normal flying schedule following a disruption can be a challenge. With air travel booming, airports are critical to aviation safety. Larger aircraft put more weight on runways, causing deterioration of surfaces and danger of accidents. When the super-heavy Boeing 777 was introduced, the FAA created a unique testing facility at its Atlantic City Tech Center. At a cost of $15 million, a test vehicle weighing over 1 million pounds was built. It can apply hydraulic loads of 75,000 pounds on each of its 12 wheels. Different asphalt and concrete surfaces are tested and measured by over 1,000 sensors. We stop about 10 feet into the rubber ramp. The results are shared with runway designers and airports accepting heavy aircraft. In Oklahoma City, the FAA has a fleet of 33 aircraft policing the world's airports. Today's destination is Tulsa, Oklahoma. First, they check the strength of the airport's navigational aid signal. Then, flying as low as 50 feet over the runway, they evaluate the airport's guidance system, which helps pilots land in adverse weather conditions. Watch your gate, sir, but it's on the go. Watch your gate, sir, thank you. Thank you, sir. 
In a year, 20,000 flight hours are spent inspecting airport standards. Flights look good, Tower. You can secure them. Okay, stand by for your part. When conditions are not met, a runway could be closed until standards improve. Farther right, you're up. You're up. Minus five. I got the yoke. Your yoke. 90. Watching over pilots is another task of the government. In a simulated control tower at the FAA Academy in Oklahoma City, new air traffic controllers are being trained. Taxiway Hotel. Right, cleared for takeoff. United 802 Heavy Hold Short of Taxiway Alpha. After spending 178 hours in the tower, these recruits will join a small army of 18,000 controlling American airspace. 25 Alpha Bravo Academy Ground, taxi to runway 28 right. How close is he? Close. To, um, close. to the <laughs> point of Alpha crossing. Alpha Bravo, Roger. That would be there first. <laughs> he told you not in the taxi without delay, would he get there before the Falcon? He or she must be able to plan ahead to think of the next scenario. What else do I have to say? Because the control instruction the controller is saying now is old news. Seneca 4359 Yankee runway 28 right, clear for takeoff. Where's the Kinger? Where's the Tomahawk? The Kinger is right here. That's the Tomahawk. So what's the Kinger going to do to the Tomahawk? He's going to run him over. So start telling them about each other. Crossing complete at Bravo. Runway 16 at Bravo. Some of the new controllers will work at facilities called TRACON, tracking en route traffic. Up to 6,000 commercial aircraft fly in American airspace at any given moment. Northwest 91, reduce your speed to 2,000 knots. The world's flying space, with its vertical and horizontal corridors, has been divided between these radar installations. The key word is spacing. Maintain three one zero knots for intra spacing. The delta is a little bit closer to the second one in line, so I've reduced them to two eight zero to increase my spacing for number three. Throughout its entire flight path, the plane is passed from one air traffic controller to another until the destination tower guides the pilot to landing. But radar controllers cannot always guarantee air safety. This was dramatized by the wave of sky terrorism that started in the 70s and intensified over the next decades. The face of a TWA captain held at gunpoint by a terrorist in Beirut became a symbol of danger for commercial aviation. In the mid-70s, X-ray machines were installed at U.S. airports to detect the shape of objects inside a suitcase. May I have a sister bag? You mind if I rerun it? In the mid-90s, the government created new standards for screening and supplied airports with some 2,000 improved machines. Have you ever wondered what happened to your suitcase lost in travel and unclaimed? It landed at this Atlantic City warehouse. Here, Dr. Eric Niederman, who runs the FAA security lab, plants various threats in randomly chosen pieces of luggage. All of this is a secret to a team of screeners who will join him in his study of how effective the current screening machines are. This is a simulated pipe bomb. Today's suitcase, with its maze of densely packed electronics, creates new challenges for screeners. I don't know what this is. It's pretty dark. It looks like it has three things, maybe a battery or something. There's some shoes here, boots. Mm -hmm. um, and next to one of the boots there appears to be something with a lot of wires wrapped around it, and it's very dense because it's blue. Mm -hmm. The orange in the background represents organic materials. Now an explosive would generally come up as very dark, very dense organic, and so it would be a, a very deep orange block. The blues and greens represent metals, and the denser or more metallic an object is, it becomes darker until it almost becomes black. There are glasses there. There's more pipes and oil filters and what looks like auto parts. Let's see what we have. Yep. Here's one pipe. 
It obviously isn't an explosive. You would usually see wires and a very small initiator that would be somewhere in the center of the explosive. The screeners must have skills of object recognition, attention to details, information processing, and decision making. Does that bag look all right? Well, what's that? It's ah, the color of those, but... Right, good eye. That looks like it could be a knife, but what makes it hard to see is the outline of the bag has a metal frame, and the knife is in the middle, near the metal frame. Wow, good eye. And... Okay, stop that bag. It's, now, do you see anything in there that looks unusual? See this? This yeah. dark area in the center? What's that? That's most likely an improvised explosive device or a bomb. Now, you can see inserted into it, into the center, is the detonator. And attached to the detonator are wires that run into the watch, which is over here. Okay. And you can see the electronics in the watch. And, the and then you can see the battery, which is the power source. Aha! I can try to pull this apart and see what's in here. Okay, what you have is an explosive. This is what you saw as being very dense and packed. This is a, a simulated explosive, okay. and it's in one shoe, and it has a detonator that's inserted into it to initiate the larger charge. Okay. And then in here is a watch that serves as a timer and a battery to give it a power to explode. Yep, right there, there. there. Improved screening technology can keep terrorists at bay. But what if they manage to avoid this gate as tragically happened in 1996 at an airport in Ethiopia. A couple, honeymooning on the Camaros Islands, turned their camcorder to the Indian Ocean. Hours earlier, the Ethiopian Airlines Boeing 767 had been hijacked and ordered to fly to Australia. When it ran out of fuel, it hit the water at 180 miles per hour. 120 people were killed, making it the bloodiest hijacking in aviation history. In the never-ending effort to thwart the threat of terrorism, researchers at the FAA enlist new technologies. The idea behind this portal, it blows air on the front and back of me and these puffers will blow on me to dislodge any particles. And if there's any explosive particles, they're collected at the bottom of this portal. To test prototypes of new security portals, people are planted with traces of bomb-making materials and explosive devices. This portal analyzes the passenger's body heat. This individual was contaminated, and when he stands in the portal, due to his metabolic heat that comes off of his body, the heat rises. This is called a thermal convection plume, and it rises above his head and is analyzed above his head in a screen. You'll see this individual is being collected now uh, by this portal. He is stepping out now, and you'll see that explosives have been detected by this portal. Safety doesn't come cheap. The cost of this machine, $150,000. The explosives are detected. Okay. This new technology has the potential of being applied at the aircraft entrance, further tightening security. When emergencies arise on board, passenger safety is in the hands of the flight attendants. Airline training prepares them for the worst. To Lai Harris, 27 years of flying and 7 million miles under her belt, trains flight attendants at ATA. Are you okay? Are you okay? Great. Go get the AED, go kit, inform the flight deck, make a medical clear. Long gone are the days when they had to be tall, slim, unmarried, and female. Are you okay? Are you okay? He is giving you no response. I'm going to lift his chin. I'm going to look, listen, and feel. For breath. Although travel breath. adventure is still the main motivation, serious safety breath. skills are required. First one went in. I know he's clear. Mike, please help this person. <coughs> he's coughing. He's turning blue. Are you choking? I know the Heimlich. I can help. My baby, my babies, I think it's choking. I know the Heimlich. That's all right. One, two, three, four, five. 
In the last two years, automated reanimation equipment has become part of the training. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and ten and eleven and twelve and thirteen and fourteen and fifteen. Pads, the patient's bare chest. By following recorded medical instructions, it allows flight attendants to deal with in-flight cardiac arrests. Stop CPR. Plug in connector, analyzing heart rhythm. Do not touch the patient. No shock advised. It is safe to touch the patient. One and two and three and four and five. Captain, this is Sue in the lower galley. We have a fire in oven number six. In an L-1011 lower galley, in-flight firefighting is practiced. Close the oven door. Close the oven door. Cut the oxygen. Second step, pull down the vents. Cut the air. Third step, turn off the all ovens. Next step, I'm going to grab my halon. I'm going to stand by with my halon. I will not use my halon. I'm going to let the fire burn out itself. The FAA requires that any commercial aircraft, regardless of its size, must be evacuated in no more than 90 seconds even if half of its exit doors are stuck or blocked. What is the signal from the cockpit to the cabin that we start evacuating immediately? Terrell. Easy, Victor. Easy, Victor. Easy, Victor. That means start evacuating immediately. Crash! Crash! Bend over! Stay down! 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 Police seatbelts! Leave everything! Come this way! Police seatbelts! Leave everything! Come this way! Police seatbelts! Leave everything! Come this way! Passenger evacuation research, live weight Number mannequins five. of infants are distributed among the passengers. Researchers observe how these mannequins are carried by passengers during a fire alarm. Uh, now this one is uh, coming down pretty well there. That was a good one. Let's go, let's go, let's go, move it. This one did not conform to the uh, protocol. We've seen that many times infants either have their heads knocked against the side of the doorway coming out and or when the parent's transporting them down, they may drop them. And we are trying to develop techniques that will uh, help parents find the best way to get out with their uh, infants. With a swimming pool replacing the ocean and no winds or waves to encounter, flight attendants practice water ditch procedures. It is an extremely rare occurrence in commercial aviation, but should it happen, saving lives is literally on the flight attendant's shoulders. We got you. One raft can squeeze up to 45 passengers. Be sure to look behind you. What's near you? Flight attendants become raft captains. All right. A survival kit contains a knife, a flashlight, flares, some candy, a copy of How to Survive on Water, and a Bible. Done. The canopy protects from bad weather or sunburn, collects rainwater. Its bright color attracts search planes. You watch for aircraft. You watch for surface vessels. You watch for land. To keep up passenger morale, singing is advised. How many of us, after entering the plane, glance through the cockpit door at the pilots? Do they have a good night's sleep? A serious argument with their spouse? Every six months, the health of the country's aviators must be evaluated. Bad health records catch the eyes of doctors at the FAA Aeromedical Institute. And so this was back in October of last year. Recent air disasters, like the Egypt air crash over the Atlantic, have brought public attention to the psychological conditions of pilots. The airman was hospitalized about six months ago for a psychotic episode uh, for five days. 
Uh, he was evaluated by a psychiatrist a couple of weeks ago who offered us a diagnosis of a brief reactive psychosis, which was due to environmental stress and sleep deprivation. But about six months ago, the airman believed that he was Jesus Christ and that his wife was the devil. Uh, at that time, he was suicidal and expressed a wish to crash his airplane. The guy's got a psychosis. I mean, he's going to have another one no matter how long we observe him for. I don't see any reason to, to send him to a psychiatric consultant. I would just disqualify him. I, I would permanently disqualify him. Along with medical evaluations, the Institute conducts research on pilot performance. Drastic spin to the left. This and study is about pilot disorientation right, while flying right, without right, navigation right, instruments, which was the case of John Kennedy Jr.'s fatal accident. If I continue the turn for about 20 to 30 seconds, I will reach the point where I will no longer feel that I'm turning. What does that feel like, Jim? Uh, I feel like I tumble. If I believe that illusion, when in fact I'm still turning to the right, my reaction as a pilot would be to turn even more to the right, which could lead to a very dangerous situation that could lead to a graveyard spiral. Another cockpit danger is a loss of cabin pressure. In a decompressed cockpit at 25,000 feet, a pilot can last only a few minutes before losing consciousness. What, 23,000 feet? In 1998, a small plane carrying professional golfer Payne Stewart lost cabin pressure and cruised for hours with unconscious pilots before crashing. We are right at 25,000 feet now. Remove your mask and we're starting the timer now. And In this chamber, pilots learn to recognize the effects of gradual oxygen deprivation on their performance. They're going a little euphoric, wedge-headed. It's getting harder to talk. Uh, just real fuzzy, kind of kind of hard to figure out what's going on. Doing a math problem is really difficult. As they become more and more symptomatic from the lack of oxygen, you'll see that their performance will go down. Now that performance going down, not signing your name correctly, can be translated into the very same thing in an aircraft where you're not able to fly your aircraft correctly. ATA has only 59 planes, but it takes a thousand pilots to operate them. We are always prepared for the very boring flight that's going to occur because every flight is boring, except for when something that is not anticipated does occur. When that non-anticipated event comes, we rely on our training that we've had up to this point. That's why we go through so much training. I make my bed every morning. I do not leave the bedroom without making my bed. I put the saw toilet seat down. So it's the same thing. I mean, you can set your clock by things that I do. I would admit right now there are times that I've I feel fear when I'm coming into land. The weather's down real low. You, you kind of are concerned. Um, you, it begins to make you wonder if, if you're doing everything exactly right and you keep double checking. Pilots practice emergencies in cockpit simulators like this one at the FAA Training Center in Oklahoma City. The computer generates a scenario from which the pilot must recover. Fire number three, Captain. Check the central power. Today's scenario is an engine fire at takeoff. Number three, start lever. Cut off. Confirmed. The remedy is cutting the supply of fuel, creating a firewall. Okay, that's max power. Rotate to go around attitude. Flaps 25 or 15. Positive rate gear up. And airspeed minimum of VAP. Flight attendants be prepared for a emergency evacuation, but don't brief the passengers at this time. 50. When procedures are followed, an engine fire emergency becomes routine. When we get in the cockpit, we are probably faced with one of the biggest enemies of all in complacency. How prepared we are to go to work is just as Before they put on their uniforms, the new pilots are indoctrinated to cockpit culture. When I first started out in this business, a crusty old flight engineer told me, you know, Dave, in peacetime, there's never been an airplane that had to take off, ever. So you got all the time in the world. You don't have to take off. Once you take off, now you got to land, but you don't ever have to take off. 
I remember years ago, there was a crash where a, an airplane was actually landed on the wrong runway because the crew was not communicating. And in fact, the first officer was so angry at the captain that he basically let the captain land on a runway that was closed at some cost to life. What happens when you have an emergency? What's the first thing you do? Nothing, right? Why do, they, why do we say that? Nothing. What's the first thing you do? Nothing. It gives you time. This wide-body L-1011 is ready for takeoff. Captain Dave Linscope will carry 230 passengers to Las Vegas. One more passengers. This is it. Tulai Harris is the head flight attendant. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to ask your cooperation at this time. I'm pleased to announce the three special flight attendants on board today. Today is their very first flight. Thank you and welcome aboard. Check. Pressurization. Normal and set to 35. In the cockpit, checklists are the rule. When the slightest problem arises, pilots turn to them. Cabin secure. Check. I don't want to push that engine up until, uh, until it warms up a little bit. After pushing back from the gate, the pilot starts the three engines. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the captain. Uh, we've uh, started our uh, number one and three engines. However, uh, number two engine is giving us a little trouble. So we're going to return to the gate. Appreciate your patience, and we hope to have you on our way uh, shortly. Thank you. Problem. Fuel control problem. Fuel control, yeah, yeah. Mechanics are called to the cockpit. We uh, sometimes experience during cold weather a little difficulty starting an engine. And we get what's called a hot start. And that seems to be what's happening right now. It's funny, it starts real good until it gets up to a starter cutout. Uh -huh. And accelerates to about 50. And the like S3 that. rolls back. We'll get on a headset, we'll do it that one. Hey, you going with me? Yeah. Yeah, what is the ATA flight 243 from Indianapolis to Las Vegas is delayed. That's the adjustment that they're making up there right now. Almost like you'd make on a car, a little carburetor adjustment. Uh, give it a little more gas to help the engine come up to speed quicker. Hey, there we go. Oh, yeah. All right. I'll leave it running, right? Yeah, leave it running. Number, uh... Hello, folks. This is the captain once again, and uh, we have good news. It's just a matter of uh, clearing up the paperwork, and then we'll be on our way. Zero three heavy. Start runway heading one two three right close to take off. Working 35,000 feet above ground in an aluminum tube, flying at 80% of the speed of sound can be demanding. But pilots believe in the aircraft's technical wonder and in their own skills. How are you guys doing? Years ago, the old mindset was the captain was God. You didn't disagree with the captain. The captain was always right. And they discovered that there were some incidents or accidents which were attributable to that because even though the other crew members knew it was wrong, they didn't speak up. We have all made mistakes. Accidents are a bunch of small mistakes that add up to a big one. The, the trick is to recognize the direction you're headed and to say, time out, stop, wait a second. If we continue this direction, I'm not sure what's going to happen. As for the public, air safety is often associated with fate. If the good Lord wants to take in an airplane, that's the way I'll go. I guess I'm a fatalist. You know, my number's up, my number's up. I take three Dramamine and pray a lot. <laughs> I mean, you never know. It might crash. Well, it's my understanding that the shape of the wing causes more air to go over the top of the wing that goes underneath the wing, and as a result, 
lifts the aircraft off the ground. The speed of the plane causes a two-thirds lift on the plane and a one-third lift from the bottom, which causes the plane to go up in the air. The wings uh, produce lift when the engines uh, make it go forward, and it, uh, it flies. Every day, two million of us take off and land somewhere in America. 600 million passengers boarded a flight last year, and the number is expected to surpass a billion this decade. The sky has no limits, but the ground does. We have to keep sharp, we have to keep ready to prepare and be able to respond in an appropriate manner when these things happen. For a number of hours, um, in a very, very warm um, day, the temperatures were, I believe, in the upper 80 degrees. A hydroplane and part of it hit this culvert, which made it slide around in the other direction at, at a portion during this uh, sequence. Prevent a fire from burning through for a minimum of four minutes. And if you combine that time with the additional protection provided by the aluminum skin and the sidewalls, this is more than adequate time for all people to evacuate in the event of a post-crash fire. 25 Gs, I expect that bin to fail. So it depends on the G level, whatever we achieve. Uh, and this will probably be somewhere around 20, 25 G. Calculations based upon the numbers we acquire from those sensors gives us a predictor of the likelihood of injury had this been a real person. In this case, the, the larger dummy, the adult male, the number we got from his head impact indicated the likelihood of serious head injury was very low. If they're out of position, then we could have an incident, incident where uh, a bag cart is actually sucked into an engine. Over here you can see that we've opened up the top of this engine, it's called the pylon, and we're looking at the air ducts and the controls that run down there into the engine to see what kind of service they're in. We've also opened up the leading edge of this wing so that we can look at the ducts that run down the wing and the wiring and the cables that run there to see what kind of condition they're in. Of terrorism, researchers at the FAA enlist new technologies. Exit the portal. The idea behind this portal, it blows air on the front and back of me and these puffers will blow on me to dislodge any particles and if there's any explosive particles they're collected at the bottom of this portal. It's knocked against the side of the doorway coming out and or when the parents transporting them down they may drop them. If I continue the turn for about 20 to 30 seconds I will reach the point where I will no longer feel that I'm turning. Now that performance going down not signing your name correctly can be translated into the very same thing in an aircraft where you're not able to fly your aircraft correctly. We are probably faced with one of the biggest enemies of all in complacency. 